Hi there, Soul Seekers. Welcome to the best of the Oprah Show on Super Soul Sunday. You know, it is just a joy for me to revisit these shows because in most cases, the message or lesson, whether it's from two years or 22 years ago, is timeless and life enriching. Exemplifying this is my very dear friend and mentor, Maya Angelou. She is the one I still look to for strength, for wisdom and comfort and courage and just to talk. The sheer power sometimes of her words and insights have moved and inspired so many people and also me. That's why I wanted to share it with you, my super solars. It was back in 1993, I got a fresh dose of her wisdom and comfort when I made a visit to her home in North Carolina. We talked, as friends do, about many things, from unthinkable personal tragedy to deep soul-stirring stories of profound personal enlightenment. But first, Maya Angelou gave me the inside scoop on the famous poem that she'd recently written and performed at the inauguration of then-President Bill Clinton. This was a big moment. Lift up your hearts. Each new hour holds new chances for new beginnings. Do not be wedded forever to fear yoked eternally to brutishness, the horizon leans forward, offering you space to place new steps of change. Here, on the pulse of this fine day, you may have the courage to look up and out and upon me, the rock, the river, the tree, your country, no less to Midas than the mendicant, no less to you now than the mastodon then. Here, on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes and into your brother's face, your country, and say simply, very simply, with hope, good morning. First of all, where were you in the house? Were you in this house? <laughs> yeah, I was in this house. Phone rings. The phone rang downstairs. I was downstairs in the family room, either coming from or going to the fitness room. And uh, the fellow said, hello, uh, Miss Angelo, Dr. Angelo? I said, yes. He said, this is Harry Thomason. So I said, oh, how very nice to hear your voice. Um, because I know his wife, Linda Bloodworth mm -hmm. Thomason, from years ago. And I thought, oh boy, they're going to ask me to write something for designing women. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, uh, I'm um, uh, chair of the campaign, um, uh, anyway, the inaugural part of the campaign, and, and uh, for Mr. Clinton. I said, yes. And he said, Because you had no inkling? No, nothing. None, nothing. This none, is it. First none. phone call. He said, um, Mr. Clinton was reminded last week that as president-elect, he could ask any poet in the country. My, my knees started to turn <laughs> to water. He said, any, any poet in the country to write a poem for his inauguration. And uh, he said without a change of, of voice, he said, then get Maya Angelou. I said, hold on. <laughs> Let me sit down. <laughs> Um, <laughs> he said, I know that nobody can ask a poet to write, you know, to order, but could you have a poem ready in a certain amount of time? And, and Mr. Clinton said he not only wanted uh, you to write the poem, but he wanted you up on the platform with him to uh, deliver the poem. So I said, oh my goodness. He said, what do you think? I said, of course, but of course, that's first. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what, what, what do I do? I mean, he said, well, Mr. Frost, Robert Frost, uh, wrote a poem within so many uh, lines. And, but you have no, there are no uh, stipulations for you. Oh, my goodness. Just whatever you'd like to say. Didn't you want a stipulation? Uh, no. No, you didn't? No, I didn't. Yeah. I must be honest. No, yeah. I didn't. So I said, thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> See ya. See ya. <laughs> Okie dokie. <laughs> I, I sat down there in the chair for the longest, thinking, oh my God, yeah. be with me, Lord. Yeah. 
because the idea of writing a public poem is very, very serious. And to write a poem about and for and to my fellow citizens, about our, our land, was so serious. Our land, who we are, yes, where we are. Yes, our what land, we mean, everything. where we could go, all, everything. Everything, what went before and who we are now and where we have yet to go and all that. That's what I mean, our country. Even for you, didn't you feel a bit pressured? Oh, I felt pressured. But you see, or and you see, um, what allows me to go on from darkness into darkness is a profound faith. I am a child of God. And there's a wonderful line in a 19th century song, spiritual, which says, I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. I love that. You see, I just don't believe it. I know that I'm a child of God. And the, the request from my president is a result of me being a child of God. And I am up to it. I come from the creator, like everybody else, trailing wisps of glory. Mm. So all I have to do is pray, prepare myself, pray and get centered and go to work. So how did you do it? Every day did you work a little when bit? When I thought about it. Thought well, about I had to wait until it could get all into the marrow of my bones and into my fingernails, <laughs> into my hair follicles. And when I finally understood what I had to do, then I started writing. And I took my hotel room, mm -hmm. and I went to it every morning, and I sat there and wrote about my country, about my own people, African Americans. I wrote about Irish. I wrote about Italians. I wrote about Jews. I wrote about anglo I wrote about all Asians, all of us. I just wrote page reams, really. And then came the work of reducing, reducing it. It's a good poem, I know that. It could have been great. Why do you think it's not great? Because I didn't have enough time. Hmm. There's a wonderful line of a journalist. A journalist said to his or her editor, said, OK, here's this piece you asked for. It's 20 pages. If you'd have given me another week, I could have made it 10 pages. Really? That's it. Right. Uh, another few months with that poem. But I'll write another poem. Really? Oh, yes. For the country? Of course. Yeah. Was it one of your proudest moments? Oprah, it would be ungrateful of me to say it was not. It was a great, proud moment. Um, sometimes people think that the public recognition is the greatest thing that can happen to one. I don't know if that is so. I think some private revelations may be greater. And I don't know, you know, the poet also must know that all comparisons are odious. So you can't say this was greater than that. I think one of the great moments, the great moment in my life, happened in 1953. I was with a teacher, Frederick Wilkerson, who um, was a voice teacher and also a kind of spiritual teacher. And he had a number of students, opera singers, all white and all very, very well known. And I was a dancer and just trying. And he stayed in my house. So he had these people come over, his favorites come over every Saturday. And we would read the Bible and read Lessons in Truth. And it fell my turn to read. I was in my own home, which was a beautiful home. Mm -hmm. And I read, God Loves Me. And he said, read it again. And I said, God loves me. And he said, read it again. And he was embarrassing me in front of all these people, these older, well-known. 
I said, God loves me. He said, now try to know it. Hmm. And I said, God loves me. Oprah, Oprah. It's still, I'm, the skies open up. I can do anything, anything I want to do, anything good, anything helpful. I can do it. You see? Yes, I do. That is the greatest moment. We'll be right back. That is marvelous. That is the greatest. got to tell you, one of my favorite Maya Angelou moments was some valuable advice she gave me on something that was bothering me at the time. She was a person I'd always pick up the phone and call first when somebody had written something that was untrue or that was hurtful. It turned out to be one of the very best lessons I ever learned in life. I got it, really got it, on a deep level, and it helps me to this day. I, I feel like I'm one of the most blessed people on earth for so many reasons. But one of the best gifts I ever received that was just, I think, more than a, a gift was, a, was, a, was pleasure and joy and a blessing all wrapped in one, was a handwritten book. See, this is her actual handwriting. Maya Angelou wrote to me beginning April 6th of 1990. And they were just thoughts that Maya had that she wanted to share with me. It really is a treasure. And there are lessons that I had learned or things that you had said to me over the years. And I think the best lesson I ever learned, when people ask the question, what is the thing you've learned the most out of life, is a lesson, do you know which, which one it is? You're, not, you're not in it. You're not in it. Yes, exactly. You're not in it. Of course. I remember it. And, and I remember also telling you that a number of times. Yes. Because no lesson is learned immediately. Right. It took me a long time to get it, didn't yeah. it? Yeah. Well, you got it, but you get it on so many levels. You see, there's a phrase that used in West Africa, deep talk, mm -hmm. meaning that you, anybody will understand on a certain level. People who are interested in really understanding more take that statement or that lesson a little deeper. Somebody else will take it even deeper. And the West Africans suggest you can never understand completely. Even at 80, as far down as you take that, that aphorism or as far down as you take the adage or the advice, you could still go deeper if you'd live long enough. Mm. So when I told you the first time you, were, you called and you, some newspaper tabloid. tabloid had just vilified you and, or, or Stedman mm -hmm. or both, and, and you were really as close to, to losing it. You were so hurt by the, by the erroneous and, and ridiculous and cruel accusations that you were just hardly getting your breath. Mm -hmm. And I said, you're not in that. And you said, yes, but you see, this is what they said. And I, I said, yes, but you are not in it. <gasps> yes, but. And then I heard you start to realize what I was saying, that that has nothing to do with you. That has all and everything to do with the perpetuator. Right. And he or she or they are going to get their living out of you getting your dying. And so obviously you can't give in to that because right. you're not in it. And you know, it happens I, to people who are on, on, in every walk of life, not just people who spend their lives like you know, I do on television every day, but I, I hear little girls who are going to school and people are talking about them in class yeah. or when people are making fun of you or your neighbors. We did this show not too long ago where there's a click in the neighborhood or a click in the office, but the, the lesson is always the same. It's You're not true. in it. It's true. They would have done that without you. This is what you have to realize. And this is true of the rape victim. You see, it runs, that, that uh, understanding is as broad as life is. So that the rape victim so often thinks that she is in it, or he is in it. That same rapist would have done somebody else. Another one of the things you've taught me is that, I love that phrase that you say, that people will try to peck you to death like ducks. Yeah. 
not just out. Most people don't have the courage to just come out and and kill you and kill you. That's true. They will take a little piece of your That's knee. Right. Yeah, they'll take the flange off your nostril mm -hmm. and a bit of the lobe of your ear, hoping that you didn't even notice it, uh -huh. you see. And that, that's called blow, bite, and blow. That means that you blow on something until it becomes anesthetized, quickly bite, and then blow again. Hmm. And the person doesn't even know he's been bitten. You see, West Africans call that blow, bite, and blow. Wow. So people do that, then that's my son's phrase, Pecked to death by ducks. Pecked to death by, by ducks. ducks. Have people tried to do that to you? Oh, many times. Many times. I mean, it hasn't stopped. I'm sure that it's happened today. <laughs> you know? But the thing is, I, I encourage you and my, I have two other people who I consider daughters, daughters. and the Black Rose in San Francisco and a girl, a woman, in West Africa, Araba. If I could have had daughters, you three would have been the, the three I'd have chosen. Um, my encouragement is to stop it as soon as it ha as soon as you hear it, as soon as you sense. This person wants me dead. The person just walks in and says, oh, you're putting on weight, huh? You say, stop it. Not me, you don't. <laughs> Not me, Jack. Not me. Not me. Out. Get out. Now, I have lost or left a lot of men who, um, you know, just in public would say something like, well, Maya, I don't know why she wore that dress. This is not the dress that looks good on her. I said, that's the end. <laughs> that's it. So the man then, when we get home, because I start packing his clothes, he says, you take everything to the max. I say, yes, because I know that once you take that flange off my nostril, pull one patch out of my hair, and I don't say anything, the next thing, you'll have me bald. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, that just happened to me the other day. I was someplace, somebody was asking me to do something. This woman, I didn't even know her, and she says, oh, but you know me. And I said, but no, I don't really, I don't, I'm not sure. She says, but I knew you when. I knew you when you were barefoot, and you were walking back some, and I was thinking, Oh, she wants me. Yeah, she wants exactly. Me. She wants me dead. Exactly. She exactly. wants me dead. This is it. But I didn't have the courage to do that. But I didn't have, have the courage to, to say, stop you it. You must. Yes. You do them a favor, mm -hmm. not only yourself. You do them the favor of not having to do that again to somebody who will actually knock their heads off. <laughs> you understand? Yes, I do. You I... really do them a favor. The best thing to do is stop them in their tracks. Just say, stop, stop it. it. Stop it. Stop it. And they say, oh, I didn't mean any harm. Mm -hmm. mm. I was a joke. Mm -hmm. You can't take a joke. No. No. Stop it. When did you, you have been such a teacher for me and so many people in the world. When did you make the transition, or have you, from learner to teacher? Oh, no, I'm learning. I am learning. Right now, I am learning. One of the joys for me in having you to talk to is I, would, I have no compunction about saying to you, this is my trouble, and I'm working on this. And you say, mm, well, I don't think so. I don't <laughs> think that's right. Yeah. And I laugh, so, and I thank you for it. Um, the greater the teacher, the more apt and eager she or he is to learn. Sometimes when I talk to you, you I think, um, this child talks to 20 million people every day. Let me pray on this. And I will, I, say, I will say, I'll talk to you later. And I will pray so that I am as close to right as possible. I continue to learn because of the people who do listen. And this is, I must say that about you, I love you, of course. But I love the fact that you listen. Now, you may go on and do <laughs> Something altogether other. <laughs> but, but, isn't, you, but that's what you would that's want me right, to do. That's right, exactly. To be my own woman. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But you listen. And I love that in you. And some part of what I say resides. See, and I remains. take it and I make it my own. I know. I can take it and I make know. it my own. I want to come back and talk about what being a woman really means.
when Maya Angelou and I get together, we love to talk and share and lessons and exchange ideas. And I always leave our visits having learned something new, like how she displays such strength of spirit in everyday situations. Watch as she shows us that courage is in our ability to tolerate and stand up for what is just. I love the way she explains this. Let's talk about courage, because right. in the book that you wrote to me, I don't even have to look it up, but you say that it is the best of the virtues, because without it, you cannot pr practice any of the others. It's true. It's true. You With have no to... courage, you can't do anything else. Well, you can do it erratically, mm -hmm. but not consistently. You can be erratically generous. You can be erratically forgiving. You can be erratically merciful and even just, but not consistently without courage. Because what happens is, suppose I decide I'm going to be um, to not tolerant, but understanding and generous to gays, mm -hmm. OK? Mm -hmm. That's because I know it's right to be, mm -hmm. and I'm going to do it. And then suddenly, somebody in my job says, you know, this guy is gay. You know what that means. Or somebody said, well, you know, she's a les, and you know what that means. Now, if I know my job depends upon it, I'm subject to say, yeah. Mm -hmm. But if I have courage, I have to say, excuse me. I'm sorry. You cannot insult people in front of me with my approval. I'm sorry. Now, so this person goes to the boss and says, you know, Maya Angelou, you know, she's soft on gay, she's probably a les herself. <laughs> and then suddenly the whole office turns, and I'm the pariah. Mm -hmm. But if I have courage, if I have courage, I can continue to be fair. Hmm. That's hard to do. It's hard to do. You know why it's hard to do? Because most people, you're right, people come up and say things that you really don't approve of, and most people just do that. <laughs> I know. That thing. And, they, and something, you see, that too is killing. That's because something dies, dies inside. inside you when you do yes. that. But I, if, if I were white, there would be no way possible that I would sit in company, any company, in my family, and have somebody called a nigger, or a kike, or a wop or Dago, mm -hmm. or Greaser, or something. Mm -hmm. I will not sit in my company with all black people, with my family, and have anybody called a honky. I will not do it. I say, not here, you don't. Mm -mm, that's poison, dear heart. Mm -hmm. I won't have it. I have been in the house when people have said, not call somebody a hunky, but when people have said things that you didn't like. I mean, what is amazing, especially in this house being as large as it is, I thought you were on the other side of the room, and you can hear it and go, all right, stop it. Stop it. Yes, I've oh, seen yes. you do it. Yeah. It's too dangerous. Mm. It is too dangerous. You see, 50 years ago, Oprah, nobody would have believed that there would be one day a button you could turn and see what was happening in Paris. If you'd said, listen, one day I'll be able to see what's happening in Bosnia, mm. And people would have put you right into the snake pit. I believe that words are things. Someday we'll be able to know and measure. As mad as it sounds, we'll be able to measure the hostility or the kindness that emanates from certain words that people exude when they say certain things. Mm -hmm. And I think they stick on the walls. They go into the upholstery. Mm -hmm. They go into your clothes and finally into your very body. Wow. I believe that. I believe it too because, you know, you can walk into some places like you feel in this house. I, I was saying that this house loves people and this house, your house, this home is best when it's full of people. It just, the, the, the laughter and love of people vibrates in this That's house. True. And there's nothing better than this house is full and we're all in here. <laughs> and we're and laughing so and loud. Laughing. And our, we laugh so loud, our heads automatically <laughs> fall back. <laughs> oh. So there have been times when I've walked into places where the energy was, the tension, the energy, the jealousy or whatever mm. was so strong, I have to say, yes, not here. Not I can't here. be yes. here. Yes. Yes. 
So what is that? Well, that's I, that sticking that's that you're thing. About. I believe it is a tangible. It's just that we can't see it. And although we do touch it, we mm -hmm. don't know what we're touching. Mm -hmm. And it is touching us and changing us. Those things that change us for the better, the prayers, the kind words, the sweetness, the laughter. When somebody says, girl, you're looking good. And something happens. Mm -hmm. you, you think you're only hearing it, but something is happening positively. And I think this is true negatively. It can happen the same way. Yes, we'll be back in a moment. I thought, thought it was interesting when you said words are things. Yeah. When did you know that? Maybe I knew it long before I knew I knew it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was a mute for many years, and words meant so much to me. I love to hear people talk. And even today, I, I must confess, I've never heard a human voice I didn't enjoy. Really? I've never. Any way people sound pleases me. Um, I've hated some of the things they've said, but the actual voice, I love the human voice more than anything, probably. And you were a mute for all about, those? It's almost six years, about five and a half years. Meaning you just, you lost your voice? No, I didn't. I left it. It you didn't left leave, your voice. leave me. Uh, uh, I had been raped and um, at I the told, age of? At the age of seven and a half. Mm -hmm. And I told the name of the rapist to my brother who then told it to the family. And the man was uh, put in, in jail for one day. He was released and about two days later I was at my maternal grandmother's house and the police came in and said the man had been kicked to death. And I thought my voice had killed him. So I thought it would be wise for me not to speak. That was my seven and a half year old logic. If I spoke, people might die, just randomly. Um, after about a year and a half, I forgot why I stopped speaking. Because did you understand what the rape had been? Did you understand what that was? Well, I knew I had been violated. I knew that. I knew I had, that he had done something wrong. But I also thought I had done something wrong. Because he used to hold me, you see. Mm -hmm. And I loved that. And uh, so then I thought, well, Maybe I, I did it. Maybe I made him do it. Mm -hmm. um, I had that, unfortunately, for a number of years. Mm -hmm. It was 13 before I really started talking again. But I loved to listen. So I would go into rooms and just think of my whole body as being an ear. Wow. And I could just <laughs> take in sound. And it's that, that uh, which allows me to speak so many languages. I simply open myself to sound. And when I speak, I have very little accent, American accent, certainly. But my, my speak Spanish, and I have a Mexican accent. My, my Spanish is Mexican. And because that's the way I love it and the way I learned it. My French is good. So when you wrote I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, was that, to, was that a, 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 a cleansing and a proclaiming of yourself to the world? I don't think so. Yeah. I've heard that that's what it was supposed to be. But really? You know, that it was supposed to be in its own way cathartic and mm -hmm. that. I don't know about that. I didn't feel that I had doffed a particular mortal coil, you know. Um, I felt I had tried to write the truth and write it eloquently. Mm. Um, but I don't know, you know, that I never agreed with Thomas Wolfe's statement that you can't go home again. Really? My belief is you never can leave home. Mm. You take it with you. Everywhere you Everywhere go. Everywhere you go. Mm. So uh, my past is my present. And everything that's happened in your past is what makes you who that's you are right this moment. That's all right. When you wrote that, did you know that it would do for me and everybody else who's ever read it, particularly young black girls? I opened that book. First of all, what you, when you open the first page, I grew up in the church, raised by my grandmother, doing speeches. When you open the first page 
And the first words are, what you looking at me, me for? for? Didn't come to stay, only came to say, happy Easter day. Yeah. When, I, when I thought, there is a world out there that's about me. Somebody knows about right, this. Right. It was, a, it was a, it, what it did to me. Oh, thank you. Was a ma it just amazed. It changed my life. And because I, that, I think that was the first piece of black literature I read, and after that I couldn't read enough. Yes, I yes. couldn't get enough. I know. Yes. That's why I send you the books by there. <laughs> yes, from that wonderful bookstore in Denver, you yeah. send it to me. Also, and have them have some books. Leatherbound, yeah. you do. Yes. Yeah. Well, when you wrote it, I want to know, hear from your mouth, why you know the Cage Bird sings. Well, there are two or maybe 2,000 reasons. The caged bird sings because it must. Mm. It must or die. It Maybe it must and die, I don't know, but it must sing. Sometimes the melody arrived at in the cage is much more fetching, much more appealing, much more profound, much more poignant than the the melody arrived at by the bird who's on the loose. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill. Its song is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. Mm -hmm. Freedom. Freedom, let me out of here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let me out of here. Mm -hmm. And so there is something universal about that song, since all of us are caged in some way or another. And so people can hear it and say, oh, yes, oh, Lord, let that bird out. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, at least I feel for the bird. I ran across in my senior memory book not too long ago, my goal, in the senior memory book, it says, take a good long look at yourself. And I ran across something that I had written. It said, I want to be a genuine female woman strong and confident in myself. Because so often on the show, we have psychologists every day who say, yes. you need to learn to love yourself. Yes. It's so hard when people are filled with self, self-loathing. Yes, and doubt. And doubt. Sometimes it isn't even strong enough to be loathing, which can be turned around. It's just doubt, it's indecision, it's confusion. Quite often, it's just, they can't even ask the question, so it's very hard to get an answer. But, you know, all the time we talk about loving ourselves. What does that mean? Well, you can't love yourself all the time. Mm. But what you can do is approve of yourself for living. Approve of yourself. For being alive. For being alive. You know, you can say, well, I'm alive and I thank God for that. And so, I mean, I did something very dumb yesterday and mm -hmm. I don't like that. Mm -hmm. Or uh, I'm not seeing as profoundly or acting as as nobly and that's a really important word it is it is it? yeah uh, I'm not acting as nobly as I know I could or should or must but I do approve of myself for being alive now you see as long as you do that you leave yourself room to grow mm -hmm. one of the reasons I love being in this house is that you are guaranteed the best meal you ever had in your life. Even if you were just here last week, this meal is going to be the be best meal you ever had. <laughs> something happens with you and food. Yeah. It's like nothing I've ever experienced. What is that that goes on with you in the kitchen? Um, they don't know. I love they know I didn't know what a roux was. to prepare food. I love to look at um, at produce. You do? I love to look at you it. You love to look yeah. at produce? Yes. It's gorgeous. Mm. It's the bounty of God, isn't mm. it? Mm. I never thought of it, but yes, you're I right. I mean, when you go into a market and you see yellow peppers and green peppers and cucumbers and eggplant and tomatoes and onions and, but, I mean, the range of color. That gets you going? It's so gorgeous. <laughs> it's like looking at a had a beautiful bouquet of roses, yeah. or flowers, rather. Mm -hmm. so, and our group of people, I love that colors of people, don't you? I mean, black, brown, blue, red, yellow, pink, white, yellow, tawny, copper-colored. God, I love that. Really? Um, but I like to feel it. 
I like to to hold food, produce and meats and fowl, and I love to cook it and prepare it and present it to people I like. I like all of that. You can, you have the kind of home that I mean that I hope to have one day, and that is. All kinds of people come to this house. <laughs> I mean, not only just in the way they look and the countries they come from, but the different backgrounds. And you can, on a Saturday night or a Sunday afternoon here, you can put yourself in 12 different conversations, as I've done many times, and feel like you're a part of all of yes. them. How did that happen? Well, I live in this world, mm -hmm. and, and I want to know... Um, I want to be a part of people's lives, and I want their lives to be, you know, a part of my life. Uh, my neighbors around, when I went to a birthday party given to me by my sweetheart <laughs> uh, a few weeks ago, um, little bitty children, some small people about that tall, stood outside in the dark singing. These are little white children and maybe a couple of black ones, and they Um, they, today the children came. They come, they feel, uh, uh, that's Dr. Angelo, uh, she's a friend of mine. <laughs> and so these small people, some blonde, some brown skinned, some dark, some black, some b b the Asian, they come and they stand in the door and I sit on the top of the step. And I say, talk to me. Tell me what is. Well, you see, Dr. Angelo, here's what happened because. And, <laughs> and they feel very fine with me, mm -hmm. and I like that. So I want that, I want their mothers and fathers in my home. That's wonderful. You've taught so much, you shared with us that the greatest thing you learned, which is, uh, is what I will take from here with me today, I will have to ponder on that, God loves me. Because my brain can't even yeah. hold it all. My brain can't even I hold know. it all. Each time, I, that was in 1953, that's 40 years ago. Each time I allow myself to say the words, I am suffused with tears of gratitude and wonder. And I am re-established as a giving, living, full human being with every right to everything right on this earth. God loves me. Me. Me, Maya. Me, the very person who's made all these mistakes, who's blown it so many times, who's been rude and unkind too many times, short-tempered. When the Bible asks you or suggests, be patient. Mm -hmm. Have patience, have courtesy, have gentleness. If a friend wants to make a, or an enemy for that matter, wants to make up with you, you go further toward the reconciliation. How many times should you forgive? Seven times 70? No, 70 times 70 and mm. on and on. And on and on. And I know that, but I blow it all the time. However, at the end of the evening when I check myself out, and I think, well, I only blew it 922 <laughs> times today. <You know? laughs> okay, then I ask forgiveness and I forgive myself. Very important. I forgive myself, knowing that I meant to do right. And I hope tomorrow it'll just be 899 mm -hmm. times, you see. Mm -hmm. But I can do that because of the realization, which I don't have to confront, because it's like a light too bright. Mm -hmm. I can only know a bit of it all the time. I can't know that all the time. I'd walk around crying all the time. All the time. Well, I hope to know it even more. I God have... loves me. Yeah. And, and I know you, it. I, know. I mean, you know, I know it intellectually. I know it. But I think to know it means that you're dangerous. <laughs> You'd be dangerous in the world. You, your light would be so bright nobody could stand it. That's the goal. That's the goal. <laughs> That's it, me girl. That's the goal. So to you, my dear mother, sister, friend, Maya, 
thank you so much for sharing always with me. And thank you, Super Soul Seekers, for watching the Vest of the Oprah Show on OWN. Have a great Sunday. It's just getting started. <laughs>